Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is a very serious issue, and I'm saying that up front because it involves an individual by the name of Count Dankula. Right, if you're not familiar with this story that we've been covering since 2016, might sound ridiculous. But for the rest of you, you know that Count Dankula, AKA Marcus Meachin, is at the center of a huge case in the UK around free speech versus hate speech. And the reason for this is on April 11th, 2016, he posted a video on YouTube titled, Mate, your Doug's a Nazi. A video he said he thought would only be viewed by some of his friends, but instead it went viral. And the video starts off with him setting up this premise. My girlfriend is always ranting and raving about how cute and adorable her wee dog is. And so I thought I would turn him into the least cute thing that I could think of, which is a Nazi. He then has the dog watch a video of Hitler. He then jokingly shows and acts like he trained the dog to do a Nazi-esque salute to Sieg Hale. He then shows the dog getting excited when he says things like gas the Jews. And he ends the video by saying, I'm not racist, by the way. I just really wanted to piss her off. And following this video, there was a big reaction online, but 17 days after he uploaded this video, he was arrested. The allegations against him is that this was a hate crime. And since then, his trial was consistently postponed throughout 2016, 2017, part of 2018. One of the last times was on January 5th. Everyone at that point thought that this was where it was going to end. But at that time, prosecutors tried to push for harsher charges that would increase the possible sentence from one year to five years. The judge denied that request, and so the trial was pushed back to March 20th, which of course is today. And before the verdict came in, we had Meachin outside the courthouse speaking to media saying, it's been two years of my life completely put on hold. I've not been able to get a job, there have been threats against my life, threats of Antifa, far left radicals. They've tried to portray me as a racist and a Nazi. Apparently context doesn't matter anymore. What they should have realized from the start is realize how ridiculous this entire thing is. Okay, he's just a shit poster. He's an edgy comedian. There are famous comedians who have done much worse than me and you don't see them getting arrested. The thing which makes it so ridiculous is that this is over a joke. I'm a YouTuber. I made the joke video for a laugh. But then people wanted to misrepresent that. But in court, that seemingly fell on deaf ears when Meachin was found guilty. Specifically, Sherrick Derrick O'Carroll found Meachin guilty under a charge under the Communications Act, finding him guilty of sending by, quote, means of a public electronic communications network a message or other matter that is grossly offensive or of an indecent, obscene, or menacing character. Giving his verdict to the court, O'Carroll said, in my view, it is a reasonable conclusion that the video is grossly offensive. The description of the video as humorous is no magic wand. This court has taken the freedom of expression into consideration, but the right to freedom of expression also comes with responsibility. He said he chose, quote, gas the Jews as it was the most offensive phrase associated with the Nazis that he could think of. It was the centerpiece of the joke. He said it was so extreme that it added to the comedy. He then went on to say that Meachin, quote, knew what he was doing, adding, it is self-evident that the material is anti-Semitic. And as far as what his sentence will be, we will find out on April 23rd. And while he waits for his sentencing, Meachin tweeted, court has ordered that I meet with a court social worker for an assessment as to whether or not a restriction of liberty order will be placed on me. This would involve the GPS tracking device being attached to me and me being placed under house arrest. And my reaction to this is this whole fucking situation is fucking ridiculous. Are Nazis horrible? Yes, fuck them. Are people who support Nazis horrible? Yes, fuck them. But people making a Nazi joke? That really? That's insane. If you watch the video, it is very clear. The, the comedy from it is the extremism of it. The ridiculousness. He sets up the premise of this dog is so perfect and adorable and my girlfriend loves it, so I'm gonna make it the worst thing ever, a Nazi. The joke is the dog is being subjected to the worst of the worst, the irredeemable. To me, the video and joke is anti-Nazi, not anti-Semitic. The fact that Meachin was found guilty, the fact that he can serve time in jail because he said something grossly offensive is horrid. And in the explanation of the decision, it sounds like he was found guilty because the guy didn't get the joke. It's insane, and I think it's a story that I, I think is very important that more people hear about. I was glad to see so many people sharing this story, also sharing their disgust. That from everyday people, fellow creators, also people like Ricky Gervais. This morning he tweeted, a man has been convicted in a UK court of making a joke that was deemed, quote, grossly offensive. If you don't believe in a person's right to say things that you might find, quote, grossly offensive, then you don't believe in freedom of speech. And that's where the story ends for now. And I wanna pass the question off to you because it gave you the story, I gave you my opinion, and now I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this? Do you agree with the court's decision? Do you disagree? Why? Why not? Let me know in those comments down below. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome brought to you by Postmates. Postmates, of course, fantastic delivery on demand app. You want something from the store, restaurant, boom, open up the app. They will deliver it to your home, your work, your wherever. Whether you're short on time or you just don't want to go out into the world and have to deal with people. But that said, if you want to make the smart move like many from the nation already have, you want to try it out, go to postafranco.com, down 
download the app and make sure you enter in code PhillyD and they will give you $100 in free delivery credit. And the first bit of awesome is we now have the full trailer for the movie Tag, which got teased yesterday and it looks awesome. We got a trailer for Marvel's Cloak and Dagger. We also got a trailer for Won't You Be My Neighbor, a documentary about a guy that I personally grew up with, Mr. Rogers. When I think back to my childhood, I remember Saturday morning cartoons, Bill Nye, Beekman's World, and of course, really early on, Mr. Rogers. Then, if you're in the mood for some food porn, Thrillist put out a video for some Filipino breakfast burritos. We had Mega64 doing If Pizza Was Video Games. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then, unfortunately, we have another bomb story coming out of Texas, although this time not Austin. Reportedly around 12.25 a.m. this morning, a package bomb exploded at a FedEx facility in Schertz, Texas, just outside of Northeast San Antonio. And according to investigators, a medium-sized box was moving along an automated conveyor belt when it detonated. And according to local media, the package contained shrapnel, including nails and pieces of metal. As far as victims, according to San Antonio Police Chief Bill McManus, there was a female employee who was treated for a concussion related to the explosion, but that was it. She didn't have to be transported to the hospital, and none of the 75 employees inside of the facility were seriously injured. Now, as far as why a FedEx facility in Schertz, Texas, Schertz Police Chief Michael Hansen said this. But we're confident that neither this facility nor any location in the Shirts area was a target. But he also later declined to say why they were confident. Also, according to Police Chief Bill McManus, this package that exploded was not the only one with a bomb. There was one other package that we believe was uh, also uh, loaded with an explosive device that they are working on right now. But then we later got an update from San Antonio police who said McManus just misspoke. Reportedly, Chief McManus misspoke earlier at this morning's press conference. There is no secondary device at the Shirts facility. Any further inquiries should be addressed to the Austin Police Department and the FBI. But then we got a little insight from a FedEx statement. FedEx saying they confirmed that a package detonated at a San Antonio FedEx ground facility early this morning. Adding, we have also confirmed that the individual responsible also shipped a second package that has now been secured and turned over to law Enforcement. Now, as far as is this situation connected to the other bombings, right now, officially, it is too soon to say, but you also have people like FBI Special Agent Michelle Lee saying, it would be silly for us to not admit that we suspect it's related. The law enforcement source also telling CBS News that ATF and FBI agents are analyzing the components of the bomb to see if there are any similarities between this and the other explosives in Texas. We've also seen reports from local media saying that the package was addressed from Austin to another address in Austin. In a statement, Austin Police Chief Brian Manley saying, the Austin Police Department is aware of the incident that has occurred in Shirts Texas and is working closely on the investigation with our federal partners. We've also seen Manley appealing directly to the bomber to contact law enforcement so they can start some sort of dialogue concerning what the person wants, what they're trying to do. And we've, we've opened ourselves up for a message and that's why we asked him to contact us and gave him phone numbers to contact us at. We also had Texas Governor Greg Abbott announcing yesterday that he would be making available $265,000 of emergency funding for the Austin Police Department and Texas Ranger. This money reportedly used to purchase seven portable x-ray systems that are used for bomb detection. Abbott has also directed the Texas Department of Public Safety to provide the Austin Police Department with 100 additional state troopers and officers, bomb sniffing dogs, intelligence operatives, and helicopters. But that's where we are as of right now. We really do not know anything publicly as far as suspect or suspects. There are more people on the ground, more people investigate. But ultimately, and, it, and it's horrifying to say it in the situation, we are going to have to wait to see what happens next. And then let's talk about the updates around the Cambridge Analytica story. Now, if you didn't see what we talked about yesterday, I highly recommend you watch that video first. One of the notes we ended on is that China Channel 4, even though there was a lot of pushback to not release their expose on Cambridge Analytica, they still did. I think it's important that we try to break down what it appears that we see in this video, as well as include Cambridge Analytica's defense. Also an important note to understand is that whenever you see an, an expose, undercover footage, understand that we don't have the full footage. There may be situations where the context is not fully apparent, things that led the conversation to a certain place. We've seen examples, we've talked about examples in the past where people have, have abused this method. And I think that's just an important thing for all of us to remember, regardless of what we're about to watch. So in the video, we see representatives of CA, including Chief Executive Alexander Nix, discussing what their company can do in elections. And in addition to him, we also see Alex Taylor, their Chief Data Officer, and Mark Turnbull, the Managing Director. The video is reportedly from a four-month investigation where they pose as a rich Sri Lankan businessman and his assistant looking to support a candidate. And a lot of the first meetings are pretty tame. They talk about collecting data on people, profiling them. You get insight on people, you segment the population, and you can target who you want. And in the video, they say, we do this in America, Africa, Mexico, we've done it in Malaysia, and now we're moving to Brazil. Taylor adding China, Turnbull adding Australia. The conversation also involves intelligence gathering. We have relationships and, and partnerships with specialist organizations that do that kind of that do that kind of work. You know who the opposition is, you know their secrets, 
you know, their tactics. Then in the second meeting, they discuss how they target people. Two fundamental human drivers mm. um, uh, when it comes to taking information on board uh, effectively are hopes and fears, and many of those are unspoken and even unconscious. You didn't know that was a fear until you saw something that just evoked that reaction from you. There's no good fighting uh, an election campaign on the facts because actually it's all about emotion. And that notion, not necessarily nefarious, this is something that we've talked about for a very long time, perception is reality. Whether it be a company or a politician, they are always feeding on your hopes and fears. So there's not really anything damning there. Then they talk about their involvement in Kenya, specifically around the incumbent Kenyatta. What you have done in the Kenya? If we have rebranded the entire party twice, written their manifesto, done two rounds of 50,000 so surveys. And then we'd write all the speeches and we'd stage the whole thing. So just about every element of his campaign. Okay. In the third meeting, they talk about people who used to work for MI5, MI6, getting dirt on opponents. But also Turnbull makes this note, which is important for something that happens later. But we're not in the business of, of fake news. We're not in the business of lying, no. making stuff up. And we're not in the business of entrapment. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't send a, uh, a pretty girl out to seduce a, a politician and then film them in their bedroom right. and then release the film. There are companies that do this. But to me, that crosses a line. Then a phone call, which Channel 4 calls the fourth meeting, involves Nick saying this. We, we are not only the, the largest and most significant political consultancy in the world, uh, but we have the, the most established track record. We're used to, to operating through different vehicles uh, uh, in the shadows and um, I look forward to, to, to building a very um, uh, long-term and secretive relationship with you. And that then brings us to the fifth meeting that is the most concerning and has been the most talked about. The video appears to show members of Cambridge Analytica talking about entrapment. This seemingly contradicting what Turnbull said in the third meeting. The investigator's talking about digging for secrets and then Turnbull and Nick say this. Uh, we do a lot more than that. Um, I mean, deep digging is interesting, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, equally effective can be just to go and uh, speak to the incumbents and to um, offer them a deal that's too good to be true and make sure that that's video recorded. You know, these sorts of tactics are very effective. Instantly having video evidence of corruption, right. putting it on the internet. Then going on to explain what a person posing as a wealthy developer would do. Yes, <laughs> they will offer um, a large amount of money to, to the candidate to, uh, to, to finance his campaign in exchange for land, for mm. instance. We'll have the whole thing recorded on cameras. Also, they talk about sending girls. Then some girls around to the candidate's house. We have lots of history of things. And when asked if these would be Sri Lankan girls, Nick's response. I wouldn't have thought so. Okay. <laughs> we'll bring some. I mean, I just, that was just an idea. I'm yes. saying, yeah. we'll bring some Ukrainians in on, on okay. holiday with us. You know? Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? But Nick's also then saying to remember that these are hypothetical. Don't uh, pay too much attention to what I'm saying mm. because I'm just giving you examples of what can, happen. What can be done and what, what has been done. Nick's also then talks about fake IDs, posing as students to get other information. I, I highly recommend, I I'm having to cut this down for time. If you want to see the full expose, I'll link to it down below if you haven't watched it yet. Now since this was released, Cambridge Analytica issued a response. And essentially their defense is that they use meetings like this to figure out if prospective clients are looking for any illegal services. Nick saying, in playing along with this line of conversation, partly to spare our client from embarrassment, we entertain a series of ludicrous hypothetical scenarios. I am aware how this looks, but it is simply not the case. I must emphatically state that Cambridge Analytica does not condone or engage in entrapment, bribes, or so-called honey traps, and nor does it use untrue material for any purpose. I deeply regret my role in the meeting, and I have already apologized to staff. I should have recognized where the prospective client was taking our conversations and ended the relationship sooner. And Nix's defense here is an important thing to consider because we have a, a, essentially one of three situations. One, Cambridge Analytica is as big of a deal as Nix was saying. They're doing 
all of these things. Or two, he was just saying a lot of really big things to see if he could land a client. Or three, he was actually trying to figure out if this person was looking for illegal services. And the thing is, the more that I look into it, and I'm not saying this is confirmed, but a lot of things are pointing to number two, that they're trying to land a client, they're making these big claims that either just aren't true or not effective. Even New York Times reporter Ken Vogel yesterday tweeting, biggest secret about Cambridge Analytica, it was and is an overpriced service that delivered little value to the Trump campaign and other campaigns and PACs that retained it, most of which hired the firm because it was seen as a prerequisite for receiving money from the Mercers. And the Mercer family, if you don't know, a family of high profile, very important Republican donors, and they actually invested in CA. And on the note of the Trump campaign hiring CA, it should also be noted that they fired CA. CBS reporting the Trump campaign never used the psychographic data at the heart of a complaint from a whistleblower who once worked to help acquire the data's reporting, principally because it was relatively new and of suspect quality and value. There are also reports from 2016 that when Cruz had used them, they ended up dropping them because CA, quote, doesn't have a level of understanding or experience that allows them to target American voters. So the question becomes, did Cambridge Analytica hype themselves into an international incident? And we'll have to wait and see because there are now multiple investigations. I mean, yesterday we talked about CA being investigated for their connection to the Brexit campaign. And actually on that note, yesterday Facebook said that Cambridge Analytica had agreed to undergo a digital forensic audit to show that they complied with the original order to delete information in 2015. Facebook also saying that Kogan, the data collector, had agreed and Wiley, the one who spoke out and had a hand in the early goings on, had not responded. But when Facebook's auditor arrived at CA's UK office, they were requested to call off the audit by the UK Information Commissioner's office. This because they are currently seeking a warrant to audit CA servers and Facebook's involvement could mess it up. And additionally, the UK Information Commissioner is also going to be looking into if Facebook could have done more. We're also now seeing Mark Zuckerberg being called to bring evidence of this incident to a parliamentary committee. That committee is also accusing Zuckerberg of giving misleading information when they had previously asked him about private information being given out. In the United States, Democrats from the House Intelligence Committee are asking to speak with Christopher Wiley, the whistleblower. We've also seen reports that the FTC has also opened an investigation into this incident. As far as public reaction, we've seen hashtag delete Facebook trending, a lot of articles popping up on how to delete your Facebook. Facebook stock has also continued to drop. Actually, last second update to this story, the board for Cambridge Analytica has now suspended CEO Alexander Nix. This reportedly pending a full investigation. And also now another update, it's going to be interesting to see if this suspension is connected to a now new video release from Channel 4. A link to this one as well down below. The House Intelligence Committee is probably going to be interested in this one. Nix was laughing, saying that GOP members only asked him three questions, saying after five minutes done, adding they're politicians, they're not technical, they don't understand how it works, saying Democrats there asked two hours of questions that they were motivated by sour grapes. Nix also bragging about self-destructing emails they send out, so there's no trace about anything they do. Also, when talking about the Trump campaign, Nix said, we did all the research, all the data, all the analytics, all the targeting, we ran all the digital campaign, the television campaign, and our data informed all the strategy. Turnbull also talked about them being behind meme acquisitions, saying they use these activist groups, saying they feed them the material and they do the work. But either way, Nix is suspended, there is an investigation, and we'll, we'll just have to see what happens next. And so that's where we are as of right now with this, where we're either dealing with this, this dirty, disgusting, nefarious company, or uh, with some people that just, they said they did a lot more than they actually do. And now that's biting them in the ass. Hopefully through all these investigations, we get an answer. But that said, that's where I'm gonna end this show. I wanna pass the question off to you. What is your takeaway from this? In fact, what is your takeaway from any of the stories that meant something to you today? Let me know in those comments down below. And remember, if you like this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button if you're new here, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications. On that note, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco show you wanna catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or maybe if you need something a little bit you can watch the newest behind the scenes vlog. Click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.